We'll begin our forum with opening statements from the candidates in response to the following question. At the heart of Catholic social teaching is the idea of the common good. The common good is the sum total of social conditions which allow people, either as groups or as individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. In your party's view, what are the most important issues that need to be addressed for the common good of Canadians today? Well, first, Brendan, I want to thank you for uh, this conversation. It's really important. Uh, and I will let your viewers know that I have actually taken notes and I'm going to refer to my notes throughout this conversation because I think it's really important for Catholics to know what we have done as a government and what we are uh, planning to do as we move forward. So thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity today. Um, and so I begin by saying that, look, at the, the world has changed enormously in the last 30 years. The rise of social digital media changed the way we live and work. Global warming has led to rising sea levels, droughts, and wildfires. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected our health systems, highlighted the importance of essential workers, and accelerated existing trends toward remote work, and brought to light inequalities in our society. So these facts are what have led to the four fundamental issues rising to the fore in this election assuring that all Canadians can have a secure, well-maintained, affordable housing, facing the challenges of climate change in a way that not only meets climate targets, but also creates new economic opportunities and greater prosperity, the creation of good, secure jobs, as well as the supports for Canadians to take up those jobs in a rapidly evolving job market. And then finally, stronger health care. And our government has taken action and we're going to continue to take action on each of these areas. In fact, these are the focus of our platform. It is the Liberal government's belief that policy must both reflect the values we hold dear as a country, as well as providing supports necessary to help people reach their full potential. If each and every one of us can flourish and reach our full potential, think of the rich benefit that this will produce for each of us and for everyone. I have witnessed this firsthand in my time as a, serving as a high school chaplain. I saw many students who faced barriers through no fault of their own. And you know, when those barriers were eliminated, what did you see? You saw human flourishing. You saw youth fully realizing their potential. Everyone benefited from this. So we recognize this as a government. As we move forward, we will do all we can to enable Canadians to flourish. Question one is on life and dignity of the human person. Catholics believe that at the moment we are conceived, we have been made in the image and likeness of God. It is from this likeness that all of our dignity is derived. Each of us is an incomparable, irreplaceable, unique child of God. And as such, we are each imbued with an inherent and inviolable dignity. We increase this likeness in our own dignity throughout our whole lives by seeking to grow closer to God with each moment of our being. Thus, the dignity of all human life must be respected across the entirety of a person's natural life, from conception to youth, to adulthood and professional life, through to their elderly years and the end of their life. What are your party's views on the purpose and the dignity of human life? And how do those views shape your party's platform? We believe that each Canadian should have the conditions for success and lead a life where they are treated with dignity and respect. And our government has taken steps towards achieving this. In 2016, for example, we introduced the Canada Child Benefit. This benefit lifted 435,000 children out of poverty. We also increased the guaranteed income supplement for the most vulnerable seniors. This increase assisted approximately 900,000 seniors in Canada. Uh, 
We also instituted a host of measures to help Canadians get through the COVID-19 pandemic. We supported families through the Canada Workers' Benefit, which had a direct impact on 1 million Canadian workers. We instituted the Canadian wage, Emergency Wage Subsidy, referred to as Q's, to help employers and employees keep the relationship strong as we waited for the pandemic to abate. We provided income supports for students as well as creating job opportunities. Whether it's access to affordable, safe, and well-maintained housing, a good, stable job, effective health care, or a clean, sustainable environment, our government has and will continue to take action. A big part of recognizing the dignity of the person is compensating them fairly. We invested $3 billion to enhance wages for workers, frontline workers in particular, and delivered $2 billion in order to sure, ensure that workers had personal protective equipment they needed. As well, we invested $19 billion in a safe restart agreement to keep people healthy, well, and safe. We instituted a $15 federal minimum wage for federally regulated workers, and we pro provided vaccines to every Canadian. The dignity of seniors is fundamental importance to our government. We've invested $6 billion in home care and palliative care services so seniors can stay in their homes and receive the care in their communities for as long as possible. We've committed $29.8 million to advancing our government's palliative care strategy. We've announced an investment of $3 billion over five years to support provinces and territories, ensuring that long-term care uh, facilities are, are, the standards are applied and made permanent, and we've provided one-time payments to assist seniors through COVID-19. Our platform commits to improving conditions in long-term care homes, as well as hiring 25,000 personal support workers and ensuring that they receive a salary of at least $25 an hour. We are also committing to 10 paid sick days for federally regulated workers. These are some of the measures that we have taken to preserve the dignity of Canadians across the lifespan, and we're going to continue to invest in the well-being, prosperity, and security of Canadians if re-elected. Question two is on reconciliation with Canada's Indigenous peoples. In recent months, Canadians have been dismayed at reports of the large numbers of unmarked graves on the sites of former residential schools, including schools operated by Catholic institutions. These findings have been particularly traumatic for Canada's Indigenous communities and peoples who have long lived with the intergenerational trauma of their families' experiences at these institutions. In the wake of these findings, numerous churches in Canada have been vandalized or burned, including many that are home to Indigenous Catholics. These tragedies heaped upon tragedies remind us that the journey of reconciliation and justice is an arduous journey that requires contrition, action, and commitment. Canadian Catholics are committed to this journey. In the words of Archbishop Donald Boland to Catholics in the Archdiocese of Regina, may this be remembered as a time when we opened our eyes and our ears, when we acknowledged the sufferings of the past and responded to them with compassion, when we turned apologies into concrete initiatives and built relationships that would build a better future. How does your party propose to advance sincere, committed, and coordinated responses by all responsible institutions to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action with the good of Indigenous people in mind, and in particular, to address the many ongoing and unconscionable crises, such as elevated rates of suicide and substance abuse, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, a lack of proper drinking water, and the chronic underfunding of reserve schools. As Liberals, we believe that our government's most important relationship is with Indigenous peoples whose land Canada has been settled. In recognition of this, we have taken many actions to improve the relationship as well as the conditions in which Indigenous peoples live within Canada's borders. We released the National Action Plan on Missing and murder Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls on June 3rd. We've committed $2.2 billion over five years to work towards ending racism, sexism, and ableism. We are at over 150 active negotiation tables in more than 500 communities and involving nearly 1 million Indigenous people to support Indigenous peoples realizing their vision of self-determination.
We put into law an act respecting First Nations, Inuit and Métis children, youth and families, so that Indigenous people could have their own system of child welfare. In 2019, we made law the Indigenous Languages Act, which provides long-term stable funding to preserve, promote and revitalize Indigenous languages in Canada. In 2016, we endorsed the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and on June 21st, 2021, Bill C-15 received royal assent. This act will provide a roadmap for the government and Indigenous peoples to work together to fully implement the declaration. We passed legislation to make September 30th a federal statutory holiday called National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. We also updated the Canadian Citizenship Oath to include Indigenous peoples. To quote my colleague, the Honourable Marco Mendicino, Minister of Immigration, Canada's oath of citizenship is a commitment to this country, and that includes the National Project of Reconciliation. This new oath now includes Indigenous, Inuit and Métis rights and will help new Canadians better understand the role of Indigenous peoples, the ongoing impact of colonialism and residential schools and our collective obligation to uphold the treaties. This is an important step on our shared journey of reconciliation. Indeed, to date, more than 80% of the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission are complete or well underway. And finally, we've lifted over 100 boil water advisories. Where boil water advisories persist, we have a team in place to come up with plans to lift them. These are but some of the measures we've taken to continue to improve the relationship of the Government of Canada with Indigenous peoples. This journey is a long one, but it is one to which the Liberals are firmly committed. As a Catholic, I feel at home in the Liberal approach. I hope other Catholics can feel the same way. Question three is on an economy at the service of people. In the words of Pope Francis, money is meant to serve, not rule. This statement puts simply the Catholic belief that our economy must be at the service of people, especially the most vulnerable and economically fragile among us, and not for the sake of accumulating wealth, particularly at the physical, emotional, and monetary expense of others. For many Canadians, particularly younger Canadians, a living wage and dignified work which supports a family and a dignified home are beyond reach. The result is that many are unjustly excluded from full participation in our society. What does your party propose to do to ensure that those most excluded in our economy have the opportunity to enjoy the great material prosperity of modern economic life? And how does your party propose to build an economy at the service of Canadians? Liberals have long believed that society should be inclusive and fair so that everyone has an opportunity to realize their full potential. That means paying attention to how we structure our society to make certain that we are not creating barriers that would discourage or exclude some Canadians from participating. Frankly, Liberals believe that we all benefit when everyone has a valued place in society, culture and the economy. We succeed as a nation when each Canadian succeeds. We succeed as people when each of us feels secure, loved, listened to, and included. Indeed, it's creating that sense of belonging that makes us strong. To this end, Liberals have enacted many measures since we formed government in 2015 to further this inclusive, fair, and welcoming vision of Canada. As I mentioned in the previous bit, we introduced the Canada Child Benefit, and we also made a $72 billion commitment to a national housing strategy. We've supported education and skills training for youth and adult Canadians so that they can get well-paying jobs. As I mentioned, we are mindful of not creating new barriers when we enact new policies. So that has meant examining the budget through a gender lens to make sure that women are receiving equal treatment. However, avoiding creating new barriers isn't enough. To have a truly fair society in which everyone can participate and realize their potential, we must remove barriers to participation where they exist. That's why we've struck a blue ribbon task force to take on a much needed review of the Employment Equity Act, its first in 25 years. This task force will come up with recommendations to help remove barriers so that the most vulnerable will have an opportunity to succeed in the workplace, as well 
We are working to we are working to open people's minds to eliminate racism and discrimination through an anti-racism strategy and the creation of an anti-racism secretariat. Ableism is a major barrier to participation in the job market and the economy, so we have undertaken a thorough review of the disability benefits to find ways to ensure that all Canadians have a fair chance to participate in our society, culture, economy, and public life. In terms of fair compensation for work, as mentioned, we provided $3 billion wage top-ups to provinces and territories. We've implemented a $15 federal minimum wage. We've implemented a number of job training programs to encourage the participation of groups that often face barriers, such as Indigenous peoples, LGBTQ2, women, Black, and other racialized groups. We've invested $350 million to support charities who are doing amazing work across this country. To me, this approach is strongly in line with gospel values. We are our brothers and sisters keepers. We also believe in the gifts and talents of each and every person. We can tap into these gifts and talents and provide opportunities for development of those gifts and talents. And when we do that, we all benefit. One of the greatest gifts a person can experience is to provide the fertile soil for growth and development. When we foster flourishing, growth and development in each other, we are doubly blessed. We see the person full of light and we see others benefiting from that person's human flourishing. This brings both prosperity and peace. What a beautiful combination. Question four is on care for God's creation. As Catholics, we believe that humanity's relationship with creation and the creatures of the earth is a sacred trust from God. Pope Francis has been clear that while we are meant to work with creation in serving with God as co-creators, the sinful exploitation of our natural world and resulting ecological crises like climate change threaten the existence of the human family. It seems too often that as a culture, we put our own immediate material wants before the well-being of others, including those in other parts of the world and all future generations. Living our vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork is essential to a life of virtue, says Pope Francis. It is not an optional or secondary aspect of our Christian experience. How does your political party propose to achieve an ecologically sustainable future for Canada to protect the God-given dignity of coming generations and our fellow children of God around the world? As a liberal... And as a Catholic concerned with the human stewardship of the earth, I'm very proud of the liberal record on the environment and climate change. Since we were elected, we have been guided by the idea that a healthy, sustainable economy goes hand in hand with increased economic prosperity. And we have been guided by the strong belief that investments in preserving our environment are investments in our future. In fact, we've invested over $100 billion in sustainability measures since we formed government. We recognize that climate change is real, and we agree with the scientific community that activities of human beings play a very significant part in global warming. As such, we have put a price on pollution. Although it seems like a long time ago, it was Canada, through the advocacy of my colleague, the Honourable Catherine McKenna, the then Minister of Environment and Climate Change, who rallied the attendees at the Paris Conference on the Environment and got everyone to agree to an ambitious two-degree target. Indeed, we've set some of the world's most ambitious targets for re reducing emissions and carbon pollution in the fight against global warming. We've set a new ambitious target of 40 to 45 percent below the 2005 levels by 2030 and implemented legislation that keeps us accountable. We've introduced an $8 billion net zero accelerator fund. And in fact, in Hamilton, my hometown, we've announced a $400 million investment into ArcelorMittal DeFasco to produce green steel. This project alone will be equivalent to removing 900,000 cars off the road. We are also offering $5,000 in grants for home retrofits, investing $4.4 billion to help homeowners and landlords complete deep energy retrofits with interest-free loans up to $40,000. We are investing $25 billion into public transit, 5,000 incentives for purchase of electric vehicles. We announced a requirement that 100% of the vehicles sold in Canada by, uh, must be zero emissions by 2035. We have a goal of protecting a quarter of our lands and a quarter of our oceans by 2025, a commitment to build 2 billion trees, 
banning of single-use plastics. Look, the list goes on and on. So we are taking strong action. We know strong action needs to be taken, and we are committed to doing that. Our Liberal government believes strongly that Canadians should continue to take these strong actions and that for us to meet our targets, this full commitment is important and we are committing to it. I personally believe that this is a divine responsibility given that stewardship of the earth was entrusted to us by God. Question five is on rights, responsibilities and participation in society. Catholic social teaching recognizes a wide range of rights inherently owed to every person in respect of their dignity as a child of God. The church also teaches that human rights are indissolubly linked to human duties. In this way, working towards the common good of all is a responsibility for each and every one of us and every institution in Canadian society. In that spirit, how does your party propose to encourage and enable the great breadth of civil society in Canada to employ their time, talents, and treasure in the service of the common good and in full partnership with governments, business corporations, and cultural institutions in order to promote the full participation of every Canadian in our society? Stewarding a civil society has long been a key component of liberal policy. Since 2015, we've put in place many measures and made many commitments that are meant to help further civil society in Canada and abroad. We have empowered organizations like the YWCA, the Red Cross, and shelters across Canada to create programs that will in turn empower women to be independent, become entrepreneurs, and escape situations of domestic violence. Equal participation in the world of work is an important way that many people find fulfillment and contribute to civil society. Making sure that everyone has a fair chance at success in the workplace is a key liberal priority. That is why, for example, we introduced a commitment to provide $10 a day early learning and childcare spaces and $5 billion to establish a women entrepreneurship fund. We have implemented anti-harassment and violence legislation in the workplace to help Canadians feel safe and secure in federally regulated workplaces. We've also worked with provinces and territories to advance steps towards the ratification of ILO Convention 190, an international treaty to recognize the right of everyone to the world of work, free from violence and harassment, including gender-based violence and harassment. We believe that women and men in federally regulated workplaces should get equal pay for work of equal value. So we passed the Pay Equity Act, which went into effect on August 31st, 2021. We created the Black Entrepreneurship Loan Fund in partnership between the Government of Canada, Black-led business organizations, and several financial institutions. This fund provides loans up to $250,000 to Black business owners and entrepreneurs across this country. We also established Accessible Canada Act to create a barrier-free Canada for people with disabilities. We are helping young people experience and op sorry, we are helping young people gain experience and opportunities while making contributions in their communities by expanding the youth employment strategy and investing in Canada summer jobs, through which over 120,000 positions were created in 2021 alone. We have addressed the specific challenges faced by Black Canadian youth by investing $9 million in community supports for Black Canadian youth, which enables groups like Hamilton Centre for Civic Inclusion to create programming that helps support Black youth. And finally, we've acted on the question of food security. In April 2020, we announced $100 million through the Emergency Food Security Fund to help Canadian food banks and other national food rescue organizations improve access to food for people experiencing food insecurity in Canada due to the COVID-19 pandemic. There are a selection of many ways our Liberal government has worked to encourage greater participation and inclusivity in civil society. They are grounded in a fundamental belief in the essential dignity of the human person and their right to equal participation in society. I feel that these resonate strongly with my Catholic faith and strong sense of personal duty to my fellow humans. Question six is on solidarity. Solidarity is acceptance of the truth that because all people are part of the same human family, part of the one body of Christ, 
what happens to others affects us as well, regardless of differences in location or life circumstances. Solidarity is found in a commitment to the good of one's neighbor. The good of one is the good of all, and the other is as important as the self. Injustice done to another is an injustice that affects everyone. And Catholics stand in solidarity with the unique injustices and sufferings facing so many Canadians, whether our Indigenous communities, our poorest neighbours, immigrants and refugees escaping persecution abroad, those living in isolated communities, those living with the ongoing mental health and addictions consequences of the pandemic, and the young, including young families, and the extraordinary challenges to human dignity they all face. How does your party plan to concretely express solidarity in partnership with other social, economic, and cultural institutions with Canada's most vulnerable people? Human dignity is the foundation of the liberal approach to government. Solidarity is the foundation of the protection of human dignity because it means understanding that the good of another is indeed intrinsically linked to our personal good and the good of society. As such, our Liberal government has put in place many measures to enhance solidarity. We enhance legislation to help further combat forced labour from Canadian supply chains. We have a policy of taking refugees and supporting them as they integrate into Canadian society. We will continue to facilitate safe passage and resettlement of Afghan citizens and will increase the number of eligible refugees from 20,000 to 40,000. We will expand the new immigration stream for human rights defenders and work with civil society groups to ensure safe passage and resettlement of people under threat, including from Afghanistan. Mental health is a key element of social solidarity. Since 2015, our government has given $5 billion to provinces and territories to increase the availability of mental health care. We are committed to permanent ongoing funding for mental health services under the Canada Mental Health Transfer with an initial investment of $4.5 billion over five years. We are also committed to co-developing and continuing to invest in distinction-based mental health and wellness strategy that meets the deep and unique needs of all First Nations to address the ongoing impacts of colonialization and residential schools. We created Canada's National Housing Strategy, a 10-year plan to invest over $72 billion to build supply and make housing more affordable and address chronic homelessness. And we've tripled the federal government's invest investment in homelessness prevention and reduction. We launched the Rapid Housing Initiative, investing $2.5 billion to create at least 9,200 new units of affordable housing across Canada. We declared trans rights as human rights and passed legislation to fully protect gender identity and expression. We introduced legislation to protect the dignity and equality of LGBTQ2 people by criminalizing conversion therapy. We will reintroduce that legislation within 100 days in office. As well, we, want, we launched the Gender-Based Violence Strategy, committing nearly $200 million starting in 2017-18 until 2022-23, and over $40 million per year ongoing. In 2021, we committed $601.3 million towards a national action plan to end gender-based violence. And if re-elected, we're going to continue to move forward with this. Helping vulnerable people around the world through the Feminist International Assistance Policy, we have made historic investments to improve the lives of women, girls, and vulnerable populations. Our proposal is to increase Canada's international development assistance every year towards 2030 to realize the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. These are some of the measures we have put in place and the commitments we have made to increase solidarity both in Canada and abroad. To me, these are policies that are in line with the Catholic approach to personal, national, and international solidarity. Question seven is on Canadian culture. The importance of local, regional, and national cultures cannot be overemphasized as means of balancing our senses of solidarity with desires for freedom of self-expression. Pope Francis has recently noted that while we are called to welcome the presence and positive influence among us, of people from other cultures, the solution to our own local cultural problems is not to spurn the richness of our own cultures. Pope Francis writes, just as there can be no dialogue with other without a sense of our own identity, 
So there can be no openness between peoples except on the basis of love for one's own land, one's own people, one's own cultural roots. I cannot truly encounter another unless I stand on firm foundations, for it is on the basis of these that I can accept the gift the other brings and in turn offer an authentic gift of my own. I can welcome others who are different and value the unique contribution they have to make only if I am firmly rooted in my own people and culture. What do Canadian culture and identity mean to your party? Are all relevant voices in Canada invited to participate in shaping Canadian culture? And if not, how would your party propose to address the building of Canadian identity in conjunction with other governments and with other social, cultural, and economic institutions? Canada has been a diverse society since its very beginning. Our country has always been a place where people had to work hard together as allies, friends, even when they were rivals. Our climate is harsh for much of the year and surviving here requires recognizing the value of people different to ourselves. If you think about it, the cardinal values of tolerance, inclusion and respect for others are what enabled original French and English settlers to survive. They had to work with and sometimes fight alongside indigenous peoples as our country grew and attracted settlers from new places from around the globe, we became more diverse. We recognize that diversity is our strength because working together in mutual respect meant that we could face challenges that thriving in our cold and rugged land presented to us. The Liberal Party has been a central figure in Canada's successful strategy of recognizing diversity as a strength. Historically, we have funded the national cultural institutions such as the National Film Board or the CBC, which has helped use modern media to create common cultural threads that bind our country together. Going forward, we propose to continue to bring Canadians together in our extraordinary diversity by strengthening our national culture of tolerance, mutual respect, recogn and recognition of differences. Liberals recognize that gaining mutual understanding happens when people listen attentively to one another. The journey of listening, sharing, and responding is truly the human career. We have a much better understanding of the other when we journey with the other. We will continue to invest in the cultural institutions that help bind those threads into the beautiful, colorful tapestry that is Canada of today and will be the Canada of tomorrow. We're closing our forum now with closing statements from the candidates on the following question. What is most attractive for Catholics in voting for your party in this election? I am someone who has led a life guided by faith and the divine. I'm a member of the Liberal Party because I felt a call to serve, a call to do something for society and for my fellow Canadians. To me, the liberal approach to government is fundamentally close to the Catholic ideal of embracing gospel values of love and compassion. Those values have led us to put place programs that benefit all Canadians, such as the Canada Child Benefit and the National Child Care Strategy. These are supports for children, for women and for families. We've supported seniors and are working to ensure that health care that they receive is up to the standard that they deserve. The supports that I have mentioned in responses thus far are all examples of the types of supports that we have put in place because we fundamentally believe that a just society leaves no one behind. We very quickly rose to the occasion when the pandemic struck to ensure that no Canadian was left behind during COVID-19. We provided support so Canadians could put food on the table and pay rent. And we did this in an unprecedented time frame. We focused on the health and safety of Canadians. We procured millions of vaccines to keep Canadians safe. We put in place measures to remove barriers to participation in the labor market, entrepreneurship, education, and government so that everyone could have a fair chance to succeed. We created a comprehensive housing plan to make sure that everyone has a fair chance of owning a home or renting at a reasonable rent. Indeed, Catholics can be confident in voting for the Liberal government. 
we are putting forward a platform for human flourishing that will continue to help support children and families. A plan to build a sustainable economy by stewarding our environment, including everyone to build a cleaner, more prosperous future. A national housing strategy that will take serious steps towards making secure housing more affordable for Canadians and taking action on health care to ensure everyone, especially our seniors, will receive the health care that they need. This is putting the gospel values of love and compassion into action. It is building a society based on inclusion and hope. It is based on justice and fairness. It is based on a belief that every person should be treated with dignity, that every person has gifts and talents, and that we can work together to actualize these gifts and talents. These are the gospel values. These are the values on which I was raised. I have to say that I was blessed with two absolutely amazing parents who taught me these, these values. How? By living them. And I give thanks to God for this incredible gift. I wish each and every one of you who has taken the time to listen today, God's greatest blessings. May good health, happiness, and peace be yours. I know these are trying times. We can all do our best to love and support one another. We are going to get through this together in faith and friendship. Thank you so much for your time.